Alrighty, I'm Brad Miller, CEO of 72 Dragons. We're a production company, but we also have communities all around the world. And today we're with Michael Doherty from Canada, from, from Toronto, Toronto, Canada. Toronto, yeah. yes. uh, Michael is a winner of several uh, Canadian Academy Awards. The equivalent of. The equivalent yeah. of, yeah, for, um, for his work as a film editor. So this will be a spotlight session on film editing. I worked on a show called Ransom. Um, production is a 12, six hours on, one hour lunch, six hours. If you're an AD, you're there before and you're there after. It's a long day. That's the mandated. And you don't get many breaks. But in post production, I'm theoretically working the same hours. I never do because my job ends when I finish my dailies. Yeah. And uh, that's that. I'm in post-production because I don't want to have to on a Friday because the directors went over and over and you've got turnaround and your call time is 5 p.m., which means you get home at 7 in the morning on Saturday. I don't want that lifestyle anymore. I don't do that. I mean, occasionally I work longer hours as an editor. If a director comes in, a producer comes in, and we really need to get it out, I have no problems working longer hours. We've got to get the show done. Absolutely no problem. Um, but it's but it doesn't it. happen very often mm -hmm. because I'm able to get the job done in a reasonable time. Um, and so I have a saner life. Uh, when Ransom, which shot in Toronto, then moved to France because a co-producing partner was French and they shot in Nice, their labor laws, eight hour day. So they would take 10 days to shoot the episode. The producers adapted That's because good. the French said it's only eight hours. Well, that makes sense to me. Yeah. Why is it that we're the only industry where we're minimum 60 hour if you're working on production and possibly 75 hours a week? So I'm in post-production because I wanted a life, <laughs> but also you want sleep. <laughs> but also, I get to control with the director and the producer what the finished story looks like. We have a huge amount of say mm -hmm. in how the audiences are experiencing the story, and that's the part I like. I was a model builder as a kid, mm -hmm. and in some respects, this is model building. Mm -hmm. I've got all these pieces, and they're sitting there in front of me, and I'm building something at the end of the day. That's what it is. Yeah, the power of the editor is really to build the story, how it's told. And it, it starts all the way back with script. You have to have a good script. The writer is the key. The actors interpret the words that are on the page. And as a result of that interpretation, the intention of the script could change because the actors brought something new. A bad actor, is not going to work out very well because everybody knows that. And so you cut around bad acting, which is too bad because then that starts to affect the script. A good director is able to get the performance that they want from the actors and is able to give you a camera position mm -hmm. that is going to help tell your story and give you all of the options for these camera positions. The editor then takes all of that material and fuses it into something that fits within the story length time that you have. And the producers and the distributors understand what they're trying to sell. And their job is to come in and make sure that what you've done fits what they are trying to do. So it's a big process. And in an ideal world, the script is fantastic. The actors are fantastic. The director did a great job. The edit came together wonderfully. The composer who helps Bring all, help out all of the emotion, did a fantastic job. The producers look at it so we can sell this and it makes $350 million As in an ideal world. That's the interesting thing about film, in my opinion, is it seems like everyone has their isolated tasks, but they go hand in hand if you want to make a really great Absolutely. Film. And the sound designers, you know, again, an underappreciated part of the business. Um, sound designers help bring a scene to life. I mean, I can, as an editor... I, I, I put the actors through their paces. I see where they go. The small little things that sound designers are bringing, it's another good career for people to get into. It's mm -hmm. subtle, but effective. It makes and when you sense. talked about genre, a sound designer is going to give you that tiny little squeak yeah. in the back of the room that's going to make the actor go, what was that? Well, that's a sound designer's job to understand. And the composer also is um, creating a soundscape. In the case of, case of Hannibal, it was Brian Reitzel doing a real soundscape as opposed to 
um, emotional scores that you might find in traditional scoring, mm -hmm. it moves up and down depending on how the scene is going. Um, and Reitzel's music worked perfectly with Hannibal. It wouldn't work on another show, but it was perfect for what we did. Um, I create full temp scores. So on a season, at the beginning of a season or on a feature, there's nothing yet from the composer. So I have to try to create the mood from the scene on existing music. It's easier if a series has been going for a while because you take pre-seasons music by the same composer. So you have the mood already established. If I'm on a feature, I try to work with a composer and get their back catalog so that I could at least find material that's mm. their voice that would fit to the story that I'm doing. Mm. Um, but yeah, we always present a finished cut with full temp music that I do and full temp sound effects. Most of the time I do. But an assistant, again, depending on how busy I get, an assistant may take that job over and do some of the... Mm. Uh, laying up of music or uh, sound effects. Terrific. Thank you. Michael Doherty. Thank you very much. It's been great to talk with you. Cheers.